guys. I know I said I was going to do um, a chapter a day, but last week my phone went kaplit. So as most of you who have cell phones would know, no fun. So I am short three chapters. So today, instead of doing one chapter, I'm going to do two. The same on Tuesday, the same on Wednesday, and that should get us caught up. So last week when we read, we were on chapter six. Um, he had just got taken, our, our friend Jax just got taken to the Santa Institute and met some people there. Um, and they, it was kind of a weird situation. So we're on chapter seven. Every day after school, Jax took the subway to Santa. In the same little office, he continued to plow through pages upon pages of questionnaires. Dr. Mako might have handpicked him, but he apparently didn't think it was worth his time to stop by and say hello. Jax was beginning to wonder if the director came here at all, or if he spent the bulk of his time looking for politicians and celebrities to pose with. In Dr. Mako's absence, Maureen Samuels was in charge, so she was the person to talk to about the Institute's function and what Jax was supposed to be doing there. But the truth was that whenever he got close to her, the scenery went a little gray. She was so traffic stopping beautiful that when she was around, everything else faded into the background, even his burning curiosity about Sienta and how he might fit in. The clues were few and far between. There's a handful of framed new articles among the many celebrity pictures, but most of them seemed to be about Dr. Mako and his hotshot connections. Mako at the State House, Mako with Bill Gates, Mako addressing the European Union, Mako at the Academy Awards. There were occasional references to the Institute's groundbreaking research or the revolutionary ideas being hatched there. Even the Institute's Wikipedia entry gave only its name and address, followed by a long resume of its founder and director. It finished with, Dr. Ellis Mako has developed his life to New York's City education and is an inspiration to every single one of us. Right, thought Jax. Been there, done that. Whatever the purpose of Sienta was, there seemed to be a standing order to keep newbies in the dark about it. Jax tried asking questions and was always referred to Ms. Samuels, if he got any answer at all. Half the time, the staff members pretended to be extremely busy rushing off to, ground, to be groundbreaking and revolutionary in some other part of the building. What was going on? Jax picked up a few hints, but they didn't add up to anything concrete. Once while searching for the men's room, he barged in on three barefoot people jumping up and down yelling, Oh! Ow! Ee! While seated, an observer made notes in a ring-bound pad. Another time, coming back from the commissioner commissary, he opened a door to find a group of people crawling across the floor on their bellies. Heads down, Faces strained with fear. Stay low, ordered one of them. He was shouting as if straining to be heard in the silent room. Incoming fire! Several staff members watched from a glass booth, one of them Ms. Samuels. So most of the other details were a blur. But Jax could have sworn that the person on her left was a dead ringer for the amazing Romalo. Remember him? Boys and girls from two chapters ago when he was at that school field trip and it was the guy who um, hypnotized everyone. On Wednesday, Jack stumbled upon a man running on a treadmill, only he wasn't exercising. Jax could have sworn he was fleeing for his life. He was fully dressed in a suit and tie and glanced over his shoulder in sheer panic. Wilson DeVeres was on the, at the treadmill control. He turned on Jax's face, contorted with fury. Get out of here! The sharp explanation threw the runner off of his rhythm. He pulled up short and the fast-moving belt hurled him off, slamming him against the back wall. The commotion brought Ms. Samuels from the office. She took stock of the situation and immediately rushed to the side of the subject who lay on the floor, stunned. Wilson pointed at Jax. He barged in here and wrecked my experiment. I didn't wreck anything, Jack shot back. You messed him up when you yelled at me. What were you doing in here anyway? How come nobody will tell me what is going on? The assistant director fixed her luminous blue eyes on Jax. It's part of Mr. Mako's plan, she soothed. Everything will be made clear when Dr. Mako considers you ready. Her supermodel looks had no calming effect on him this time. Dr. Mako didn't see what I just saw. This poor guy was running for his life like he was being chased by a pack of wolves. It was a tiger, Wilson blurred, blurted out angrily. 
What? Samuels put up her hand, put her hands on Jax's shoulders. We need you back at your testing. Wilson, call the nurse. Everything is under control. It was a tiger. The world words kept echoing in Jax's ears. Was Wilson making fun of him? It wouldn't be the first time. The guy was a class A jerk to everybody, but he always saved his best stuff for Jax. But another thought nagged him. What if Wilson was telling the truth? Obviously, there was no tiger chasing the man on the treadmill, yet maybe he thought there was. You didn't get that scared from nothing. Hallucination. Could be. Could that be the missing link between Santa and Jax? So far, his visions had just been reflections of himself, but that didn't mean they couldn't get worse. Was this only the beginning and eventually he'd be fleeing from a non-existent carnivore? Exceptional skills in the area of communications, Mako's letter had said, but maybe that was just the bait. The director wouldn't attract a lot of fresh blood if he started off his invitations with Dear Fruit Loop. Could Jax be a patient here? Not a participant? What if Santa was some kind of experimental psych ward? Was that what made the place all fired groundbreaking and revolutionary? It certainly would explain why no one would reveal the Institute's real purpose. If that were true, were Mom and Dad in on it? Jax doubted it. Okay, they had sent him to see a shrink over his strange visions, but the family had abandoned that idea after Dr. Gunnenberg tried to jump out the window. And while his parents peppered him with questions about his afternoons at Santa, their tone was always interested and upbeat. If they thought I was a psycho, there'd be a lot less smiling. A mental patient? You? It was Tommy's reaction when Jax told him his theory the next day. No offense, Opus, but you're not that interesting. It makes no sense. They leave me totally on my own in the testing room. I could paint half the Institute purple with my toes before anyone would notice. That's not how you treat a real crazy person, right? Well, what about the other kids? Are they patients too? Jack shrugged. I'm pretty sure I'm the only one who's still in the dark about Santa. I think the others know more, but I could be wrong about that. I could be wrong about all of it. What are they like? Tommy probed. Are they all as bad as that Wilson guy? He's the worst. But, every, but, but nobody's exactly friendly, Jax replied. They're probably warned not to talk to me, so they can't let slip any, something I'm not supposed to hear. Every time I get into the lounge, I hear the conversation dying. It's like I've got leprosy. His friend was oddly triumphant. Just because you get picked for something doesn't mean it's going to stink, Tommy lectured. This is no different than that debate team or the student council. You're not crazy. You just signed up for, crummy, for a crummy institute. On Thursday afternoon... A blessed event occurred at Santa. He's on question number 1409 of the quiz stuff that he has to do. How much importance would you attach to a career in lightning smudge pots to keep frost off fruit trees? And there's the question. His response was very little importance. It was the last question. Jax's pencil was down to the nub and so was his patience. He rushed to the office to hand in his work and find out what was next. Surely something was going to start making sense around here. Ms. Samuels favored him with a heart-stopping smile. Thanks, Jax. We really appreciate all your efforts on this. She disappeared into a supply closet and came out with a fresh armload of pages. Now you just have to complete part two and you're on your way. Jax said one word. No. She frowned. It's required. Dr. Mako says, I've been here a week already and Dr. Mako hasn't said anything to me so far. For all I know, Dr. Mako doesn't even exist, and you photoshopped him into all those pictures. I quit. I double quit. It was a little hard to turn on his heel because he couldn't take his eyes off her, but it was worth it. Dr. Mako hasn't interviewed you yet, she protested as he headed to the elevator. That's why I quit. As he left the building and headed for the subway, he felt 50 pounds lighter. It bothered him a little now that he was never going to know what they were actually doing in that dumb institute, but he is pretty confident that whatever it was, he was better off without it. If he was losing his mind, he'd find out soon enough. He didn't think so, though. Quitting was the sanest thing he'd ever done. Tonight, he was planning to give his parents an earful. They'd be disappointed to find out their only son wasn't special anymore and probably never had been. He wasn't even sure how he was going to describe it to them. The place was either really crazy or really stupid. The jury was still out. Back at his building, he waved to the doorman and took the elevator up to seven, grim with purpose. Maybe mom and dad wouldn't entirely believe him, but they were going to have to accept his decision. Even without all the weirdness, he had better things to do with his time than fill ovals with a number two pencil. As he opened the door of apartment 7J, he was already planning his counter arguments for when they tried to convince him to go back. He 
get to hear his mother on the phone in the kitchen. Well, it's been a pleasure talking to you. It means a lot that you phoned personally. Yes, we feel the same way. Thank you so much. See you tomorrow. Jax tossed his backpack in the corner. Who was that on the phone? That was Dr. Mako. Jax was floored. No way. I know. She blushed like a fangirl. What an extraordinary man. Are you kidding me? The guy never even shows up at his own institute. He probably is just some actor they hired to post for pictures. The only reason they got him to call you is because I quit today. She looked annoyed. Annoyed. You know, I really don't understand your sense of humor. Dr. Mako couldn't say enough about the quality of the work you're doing. That's because he doesn't know, Jax protested. I've been doing nothing all week. Well, everybody starts at the bottom, she reasoned. But Sienta is expecting big things for you. Dr. Mako made a point of telling me that. I don't believe it, Jack said flatly. Well, he'll be able to tell you himself. We have a meeting with him, me, you, and your father, tomorrow at 4.30. Jax toyed with the idea of refusing to go, but his curiosity got the better of him. He had to see with his own eyes if the man, the myth, the legend really exists. We're on chapter 8. I will do two separate videos, um, not one big one because these are really long, and I don't want to make it a 20-minute upload. So, we will begin chapter 8 um, of The Hypnotist, Gordon Corman, in our next video. Bye, guys. See you soon.